And Emily joining us right there next to you in the magic of television. There he is. That's me. That's Phil Schreier. Now, well, Phil, let's explain to Emily what the Curator's Corner is. It's her first time here. So, so Emily, the first, Curator's Corner is a little something that Phil and I started over uh, adult beverages and cigars many years ago out in Albuquerque at the National Police Shooting Championships. We had talked with Phil many times and done a lot of things at the museum. As you know, the NRA has one of the premier firearms museums in the country. And we talked, and I said, and Phil is the, the – and Phil, I'm going to run your credits here. He's, he's, he's an awesome storyteller. And I said, Phil, wouldn't it be great if we had a feature where we could get you on, talk about some firearms, and tell some great stories? So hence the Curator's Corner was born. So uh, Phil you, and I usually tape something, or we'll sometimes do stuff with Jim Sapika from the museum and other people. And, and so I talked Phil into coming out to do a live Curator's Corner. So he's going to tell us about some firearms that he has, and, and we're just going to kind of go through that right now. So hence the Curator's Corner. Phil, what do you got tonight? Well, John, I've got a, uh, a couple of neat uh, semi-automatic pistols. Uh, but I thought, you know, instead of talking about guns tonight, I thought you and I could compare scars. We've had uh, major <laughs> operations recently. <laughs> Oh. Okay, I'll just say <laughs> we just lost any <laughs> listener we had. Can we go back to the guns, please, boys? <laughs> I don't want to talk about either of your scars. I want to talk about those two cool guns and what they are. Well, you know, it, it, John knows the story. My scar came from being the last official casualty of the Spanish-American War. We were unloading Theodore Roosevelt's machine gun when, uh, when I ripped my bicep tendon. So John and I were both in arm casts for uh, for a while. Yes. Oh, it was, it was not not a good story, but it, but a great gun out there at the firearms museum. And one of the guns we talked about before, John, was the knock volley gun, and um, we're really proud of the American Rifleman magazine. We're really proud of our assistant curator, Matt Sharp, mm -hmm. has a f his first feature article on the knock that you and I have talked about on this program before, in the December issue of the magazine. Major typo, though. It says assistant curator Matthew Sharp. Matt's now an official curator at the oh, museum. Oh, he's now, so he's, he's, he's he's now graduated. Excellent. He has. Very good. So that's in the American Rifleman magazine. Yep, and Check we also want to say hi to our very dear friend Paul and deep in the heart of Dixie, who's been serving our nation's flag for 20 years. And uh, we know that Paul's watching right now. Excellent. The first so gun what I do you have. Well, uh, we all know about the 1911. John, we've talked about the 1911 Colt many times. Mm. Uh, we had the 100th anniversary. 100th anniversary show. Uh, if you look real carefully at this one, it doesn't look like any other 1911 that you've probably ever seen. Uh, this one has a, an interesting uh, slide release here, and uh, the markings on it are, are not uh, the standard Colt factory markings that you would find on any of the nearly five, six million 1911s that have been made uh, for, the US, uh, for the U.S. military. And why is that? Why, why doesn't it have this market? Well, this gun is particularly interesting and rare in the fact that it is one of two guns that was actually licensed by Colt for manufacture overseas. Hmm. And uh, in 1914, the Norwegian government uh, paid Colt a, a fee to license the production of the 1911 in Norway. Uh, so this is a Norwegian 1911. Uh, they were manufactured from uh, 1914 until, uh, until the end of World War II. Uh, this particular model was made in 1926. Uh, you know, I, I wish a lot of gun manufacturers had the code marks that, that these Norwegian guns, I get calls every day, how old is this gun? And uh, are there dates this on there? dates actually stamped right on the frame so you can mm -hmm. see it. See it right there, it says 1926. And um, that's really neat. All the parts are interchangeable with the standard 1911. The, uh, the slide release has an extended uh, thumb piece uh, to it that um, allows you to, uh, to you know, drop the, uh, drop the uh, slide real quick. Uh, probably the only improvement that was ever made to a John Browning uh, design. The, uh, uh, other than that, every uh, one of the unique features about the pistol is that every single uh, part on the gun is a serial number to the gun. Wow. So you, you can tell whether you have a, uh, uh, a complete gun, whether it's original or not, by just checking the serial numbers that they all match. You've got a 100% uh, wow. gun, which is this that, one I is. I mean, I'm, all, I'm, a, I'm a year into being, not even a year that I've owned a gun, so it's all new to me. Do, do, does every not every gun have serial numbers on the parts? That's a unique thing. M most guns I've have a. Looked, a I'll say. <laughs> they're required to have a serial number on the frame of the gun. Uh -huh. uh, 
in, on some 1911s, you'll also find a matching serial number on the slide in the World War II version of the 1911A1. The, uh, uh, it's very rare for any American gun to have multiple serial numbers on it. The Germans tended to do that uh, a lot with the Mauser rifles. Mm -hmm. It kind of creates a, a conundrum for collectors because the more serial numbers there are on a gun, the more chances there are for a part to have been replaced. Right. And if that was replaced, that brings the value of the gun down. So but to have the original with all the parts makes it extremely valuable. Exactly. exactly. All right, Phil, we've got about five minutes left, so let's go ahead and look and see what else you have there, sir. Well, uh, another interesting semi-automatic from the time period uh, of the development of the 1911 is the, uh, the Webley and Scott. This is the British version of, uh, of a semi-automatic pistol uh, that was made prior to World War I. This is the 1912 uh, uh, British uh, pistol. It's in 455 self-loading is the name of their caliber. Just a little bit bigger than a, uh, a standard 1911. Uh, it doesn't have anywhere near the panache or the, uh, the design <laughs> right. beauty that we've right. come to know kinda, and love. Kind of square boxy utilitarian. Exactly. Uh, one of the reasons is that the, uh, the, the spring that operates the, uh, the slide. Is that what, what is that little circle at the bottom that this... Oh, that's a lanyard loop. Uh, you could uh, drop a, uh, a rope through that, a lanyard tied around your neck what? and your shoulder so that when you were riding horse, these were originally made for the horse artillery. Oh. Uh, you could drop the gun and it would still be at your arm's length at your side. Oh, that's so nifty. So they, uh, they did that. In fact, the, uh, this has a lanyard loop here on the, on the magazine of the gun of the 1911. Very rare early mags had that lanyard loop on them as well. Interesting. Um, the British gun, uh, the actual springs to work the slide are located in the grip of the gun. It's a gigantic oh. V-spring, whereas in the Browning uh, design Colt, the, uh, the spring's right up here under the barrel, the return spring. Uh, the, the grip uh, uh, doesn't have, have all that going on. This weighs almost 10 ounces more Ooh. than the 1911 That'll does. wear on you after a while. It will. Can I hold it? Uh, sure. I mean, it, 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 as we always do, we clear the magazine. We check to make sure it's unloaded. Unloaded. Thank you. And there you so go. So why does this gun? Why does what's the? And, I'm, I'm, and people always get mad. I'm still learning my lingo, but this is the barrel and this is the slide, right? Right. Why is it exposed? Like I've never seen that. What's well, the point of that? On 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 this particular piece, uh, the barrel is. Uh, is as thick as they needed it to be to withstand the pressures of the cartridge. Uh, any thicker would add weight to the gun. Uh, the, uh, the barrel is shrouded on this gun because it also houses the spring, uh, the return spring, whereas the return spring for that is located in the grip. So oh. that can be exposed. Oh, One I of the, the neat aspects of, uh, of, of the uh, Webley is that you can break it down a lot easier uh, than a Colt. And uh, you know, for a Colt to, to break down, you uh, remove the magazine. You can slide this open and pop that. And I can do this without breaking my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say, as I you're talking about weight, easy. this is a we, heavy we don't, gun. You say we don't need an <laughs> another scar there, Phil. Right. So. <laughs> this but one is, you said the weight would definitely, now that I'm holding it, it would, yes. it would be, take some wear. <laughs> Ten, yeah. ten ounces would wear on you after a, a while when yeah. you're putting hundreds of rounds or thousands of rounds through a firearm like that. It actually weighs uh, 47 ounces compared to the 38 that uh, a Colt And I weighs. will just say, it just what if I'm holding it up just to eye level, it's it's a it's a weight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that, and that's why with a design like the, the the 1911 there, you see it around, and that one you don't see around anymore. Well, there's about five to six million of these out there. Uh, there are about, you know. 10, 12,000 of those wow. out there. So the numbers and are. How many of the Swedish made ones are there? Uh, of the Norwegian models, Norwegian, there were. Sorry. That's right. There were uh, 32,000 of them made. And um, they, uh, they were the only co country in Europe that was actually you know, equipping their military with a, a 45 caliber bullet, while everybody else had gone to a 9 millimeter. Right. Um, in fact, on uh, April. Uh, 10th of 1940 when the Germans uh, attacked Norway, the, uh, the Konigsberg 
uh, firearms factory where these guns were made uh, was seized, occupied, and the Germans turned out about uh, 3,200, 10% of the overall production uh, between 1940 and 1945 mm -hmm. uh, was German manufacture under the uh, under that roof in and Konigsberg. Can they tell the difference except for the date? Are you they can. They're, they're numbered German marks on the guns. Some of the ones in 1945 Which are marked completely different. M causes the value to skyrocket. I was going to say that adds the value. So, wait, people want the German ones? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why? Anything with a Waffenamt, a swastika, a Reich's Eagle. It's <laughs> <laughs> I totally. Well, I mean, I'm not going to change the value of one person here alone, but I would I would say, like, let's, let's just no one buy those Nazi guns. <laughs> It's, it's a large facet of gun collecting. <laughs> All right, folks, that's it. This Quick fill so before we run out of time. How to get more information about the National Firearms Museum. Visit us at nramuseum.com on the Internet, uh, our, our YouTube, our Facebook page. We love to get uh, likes on our Facebook page. And uh, visit us in Fairfax, Virginia. I really want to come out there. Right off of Route 66, an intersection of uh, US 50. We're open seven days a week, 930 to 5.